Men's folly in the pursuit of military glory takes centre stage in this afternoon's play, The Charge of the Light Brigade, the premiere of John Osborne's never seen screenplay. The Charge of the Light Brigade by John Osborne. Music and lyrics by John Tams. Producer Nicholas Newton. Directed by Bill Bryden. satisfaction and anxiety and offers her prayers to the Almighty to protect her army and fleet and bless this great undertaking with success. The cause is a just one, if any war is just, and I will not believe that in any case British arms can fail. Four things greater than all things are women and horses and power and war. That is our story but no one would have known it at the beginning. The Charge of the Light Brigade by John Osborne. And it was a famous story For a claim both fur and wide So let your children's children Re-echo its wind pride Oh, Cardigan the Fearless, his name immortal made when he crossed the Russian Valley with his famous light brigade. So, thank you for your time, Mr. Osborne. The one last thought. Yes. When you wrote Charge of the Light Brigade, which of the characters first attracted you? That's a silly question. Was it Lord Cardigan? No. His mad brother-in-law, Lord Lucan? Get away. Was it Captain Nolan? Nolan? Oh, he was some kind of impetuous Irish-Italian, a genius on a horse. But he was the cause of everything. Captain Nolan was in love with utterly impossible situations. That's what he thrived on. Think what it was like at the time. Six hundred stalwart warriors All of England's pride the best did grasp the lance and sabre on Balaclava's crest and win their trusted leader and Cardigan the brave dashed through the Russian valley to glory or regret. Exterior day, 1853, parade ground. Lord Cardigan at the head of his hussars the 11th. Lord Cardigan is in his 50s, a magnificent comic figure. Arrogant, ungifted, impenetrable, a caparison divine right Tory. He is, in the words of the historian Kinglake, as innocent as a horse. Cardigan passes along the ranks of his drawn-up regiment. His eye lingers fiercely over every detail of men and horses. That one. Yeah, scabbard. Yes, they're good. About time. Good. That's a well-shaped devil. Pants need a tailor to them. Nearly all of them. Type, I said, didn't I? Said so enough times. Why else do they think they're called cardigans, cherry bums? Cherry bums. Thirty thousand pounds my own money. How a smart, proud regiment should be turned out at last. Indian officers. I'll whip out every dull mongrel scum of them who isn't up to it in the 11th. Not so bad. Quite a good turnout. No better than it should be. Miserable ass pack of mutineers, some of them. Still, looking like Cardigan's men. Some of them. Nolan! Morris! <laughs> 
<laughs> My dear Captain Nolan, what a joy it is to see your face. Uh, I was about to look for you. I just heard you'd arrived. Tell me about Clarissa. Where did you meet her? What? Oh, uh, Clarissa, you banished her from my thoughts. About being a soldier and all that, it's a rum business, isn't it? Clarissa? Yes, well, you'll meet her soon enough, if his lordship will allow. Lewis Edward Nolan is an impressive-looking man, about 35. He has the look of a romantic, but the intelligence of a self-divided and complex personality. The mould is heroic, but molten with secret fears and questionings. But there is also something about him. Some hard wildness. Exterior day, barracks. Cardigan rides up through the early morning mist. Yes, sir. Who are you? Captain Nolan, my lord. Who? Nolan, my lord. Captain, who do you say? Captain Nolan, my lord. Late of the 15th, Miss Ars. Is he now an officer of this regiment? Why do I not know that Captain Lockwood? Uh, lord Regan, uh, uh, confirm the appointment in your absence, my lord. Did he? Nolan, are you the writer Johnny one hears about? Captain Nolan has written two cavalry manuals, which, as your lordship may know, are very highly regarded. What are they called? Cavalry, its history and tactics, and the training of cavalry remount horses. What do you call them? Cavalry, its history and tactics, and the training of cavalry remount horses. Never heard of them. Are they in the English language? Yes, my lord, and in German and French also. And what is your system? My... System, sir, that you have for training cavalry horses, your system. May we all know of it? It is... Is? Difficult to reduce to a word, my lord. Is it? However, I should say, kindliness. Indian officer, are you? I was at Cornwall with the 15th, my lord. So I had thought. My lord, I have already a request to make, that I can have leave to attend a wedding as best man. So, best man, is it, Nolan? Want you to be best man, do they? What do you say the groom's name is? <clears throat> Captain Morris here, my lord. <laughs> oh, Captain Morris, indeed. For him you may. You're lucky, sir. <laughs> my congratulations. Thank you, my lord. We'll be back for my parade. Exterior day. Music appropriate to a wedding. Captain Edward Morris and his bride appear at the doors and pause. Nolan appears in the background. Some common people look on. A few cheer the bride, Clarissa Morris. She is pleasing to look at, observant, intelligent, sheltered but full of curiosity and eagerness. They make their way to the waiting carriage, ascend. Then the wedding feast and reception. A lighted marquee stands on one of the lawns. Inside the marquee, the bride and groom are in conversation with the group, including the Dubalists. <laughs> yes, yes. Widing, widing, widing. We never stopped till Newmarket. What a hunt. Not a sign of a fox. But the master caught a wabbit. Mrs. Dubally is Cardigan's mistress. She is young, pretty, slightly boyish. Mrs. Dubally. And what is your regiment, Captain? The 11th Hussars, madam. Ah, Cardigan's unfortunate. Mm. I'm certain Lord Cardigan has been horribly maligned, Captain Dubois. My dear Lady Ewell, even the Duke of Wellington. The Duke would never have allowed outsiders to interfere with the conduct of the army. Oh, and certainly not Parliament or any gaggle of politic and radicals. Mm -hmm. Lord Cardigan is a gentleman, which is indisputably more than can ever be said for the editor of the Times. <laughs> He certainly has the most beautiful golden hair. Like an exquisite lion. And nothing but empty air inside, they tell me. <laughs> That's a most improper remark, Captain Dubally. But particularly in front of Captain Nolan. What about it, Nolan? I agree with Lady Errol. It would not be proper to pass judgment on one's commanding officer. Besides, I've scarcely made contact with his lordship yet. <laughs> I've been with the 15th. India? Oh. Nolan had a commission in the Austrian army, Ag captain without purchase in the 13th, and they made him riding master, breaking the nags in according to his own methods. And he's been to France and Germany and... Oh, Russia, to study the subject, haven't you, Nolan? Henry says the men of the 8th are absolutely splendid fellows. If it should come to war with Russia or anyone, it would be a privilege to fight with them. Tremendous. Tally-ho! <laughs> That's surely evident. My Lord Errol says we should lick an army three or four times mm. our size. <laughs> What's your opinion, Nolan? 
The infantry army is probably the best in Europe. As for the cavalry, which is my own interest, I would say we have the finest horsemen in the world. Everything turns on the quality of our officers. I'm sure you didn't help, Captain Nolan. Everything depends on knowing what is important and what is not. A cavalry officer must depend on the strike in his eye and when he chooses to use it. How highly do you value comradeship, Captain Nolan? Very highly, Mrs. Morris. <laughs> First time, eh, my dear? <laughs> proper comradeship should run from top to bottom. But proper comrades are as rare as truly loving wives. Captain Nolan is clearly a cynic, Clarissa. Really, Captain, on such a day. Nolan, a cynic, my dear Fanny, you are positively mistaken. A dreamer, you may say, but a cynic, not on your life. Clarissa scarcely knows him at all. Come, my dear friend, you must dance with the bride and make each other's acquaintance. Edward talks of you constantly. I shall tell him to stop. <laughs> Edward says you are the finest horseman in England. Oh, does he? He says probably in all Europe. No. Edward is extravagant. I think not. Are you? They say Lucan calls his brother-in-law Lord Cardigan the Featherbed Soldier. Hmm. And Cardigan calls him the Dwillbook Soldier. <laughs> but what's wrong with Dwillbooks, I say? Mm. Hey? Or, indeed, with Featherbed. You seem distracted, Captain. Please forgive me. It is quite a wrong impression. I am sad we have not met before. I am too. Edward is a fortunate man indeed. Your heart must be full today. It is. But... But what? He must know what is passing through my mind. I believe so. Tell me it is the same for you. I'm ashamed. He is my closest friend. I think then what I must feel... It is an impossible situation. It may seem impossible, but that is what is happening. You sound almost as if you relish that. Perhaps I do. Advance! They tell me Lord Cardigan paid £30,000 for the command of the 11th. So much for a regiment? My dear, Cardigan spends 10000 a year of his own income, his own income, mind, in keeping up the 11th. £10,000? Well, those tailor's bills for the men's uniforms. He pays out of his own pocket. And then the court's marshal and, and desertions and all. Superb turnout, your lordship. Quite a triumph. The rewards of discipline and vigilance are all displayed here today. There is nothing wrong with the 11th. I shall tell Raglan, never seen a regiment in finer order. Wish I could stay longer. Will you not dine in the mess tonight? No, I must leave at once. However, I take good news back with me to Lord Raglan. You and your men may celebrate that. Indeed we shall, General Larry. That I promise you. <laughs> Champagne only! Nolan eats quietly. One of his guests asks him, Captain Nolan, could we have some Mazelda, I think? Nolan calls over the mess waiter. Cardigan watches him carefully. All along the table are bottles of champagne. Suddenly, the mess waiter bends over beside Nolan and places a black bottle on the table. Don't decant it. And leave it on the table. You, sir. You. Captain Nolan. Captain Nolan. Nolan! My lord. You, sir. You are drinking porter. No, my lord. You are drinking porter, sir. I assure you I am not, my lord. Damn you, Captain Nolan, you contradict me. That is a black bottle before you, and you are drinking porter Captain from it. Captain Nolan, it was his lordship's express order that champagne only should be served in the mess this evening. I was not aware of it, Captain Lockwood. My lord, I apologize. Apologize, sir. You are drinking porter in my mess. It is not porter, my lord. That is a black bottle, is it not? I asked if I might have a most certain set of champagne, my lord. Captain Morris's guest... I will not have porter or any other beer drunk in my mess. 
I've said so before. It is a drink for farmers and laboring men. Did you not know I've forbidden it? He says it's a Moselle, my lord. What? Moselle? Moselle, you say? Then you'll know better, Captain Nolan. A gentleman decants his wine. He does not drink it from the bottle like a cow herd. I am in error, my lord. May I have your permission to leave the mess? No, sir, you may not. The toast to the regiment is to be proposed. You will charge your glass of champagne and join us. My lord, gentlemen, the eleventh. Yeah. My lord, with your permission, may I propose your health? For in your health lies the strength of the eleventh. Gentlemen, the Earl of Cardigan. The Earl of Cardigan. Captain Nolan, as president of the mess committee, I've been asked by Lord Cardigan to remind you of your disorderly behavior in having a black bottle placed upon the table, as you did last night. I have apologized to his lordship. He says further that you are to remember in future that the mess is to be conducted like a gentleman's table and not like a common alehouse. This is an offensive message for one captain to deliver to another, however merited. You'd done better not to have delivered it, particularly before an audience of your brother officers. Interior day. The regimental stables, long, high and beautiful, almost like a chapel. Quiet, except for the sounds of horses breathing and rustling straw. In this chapel-like atmosphere, Nolan makes his way down the aisle of beautiful mounts. He stops in front of his own and puts his head against her. Presently he walks on, his footsteps echoing on the stone floor towards the tack room at the end. The walls are covered with regimental saddles. Lines of gleaming tack hang from the ceiling in hundreds. Pure black sheepskins, embroidered horse cloths and long plumes. Nolan gazes up at them all and moves among them, down towards a high window at the end of the room, also very like the window of a chapel. Very well, then. What have you to say, Captain Nolan? Well, I beg leave, my lord, to apply for court-martial. Court-martial? Out of the question. My lord, I must insist you allow me to present Insi my case insist, publicly. Insist, do you? You impertinent, dismal, insubordinate Indian devil. There is no dishonour in service in the field. The Chilean Get wire. Down, Chilean wire. You dog. You upstart dog officer. Get out. The horse guard's office of Lord Raglan. Huge objects and props dominate the room. Overwhelm Raglan. There is a large bust of the Duke of Wellington. Lord Raglan is a kindly, extremely handsome man in his sixties. There is a gentleness, reserve and tact in his face, more the qualities of a cleric or a diplomat than a professional soldier, which, however, he has been all his life. He has lost an arm in battle for his queen and beloved duke. He has served the Duke of Wellington for thirty years, and his will to decide or make any decision is paralysed by his devotion to him. Airy is with him. My lord, have you seen the Times this morning? Well, that damn sheet has no love lost for the army, but even less for his lordship. Mm. Lord Cardigan is a rather autocratic gentleman, but it's clear that he cannot be subjected to all this vulgar, unwarranted abuse from all sides. It is unfitting for him and for us. Well, is that not all? Uh, no, my lord. There are matters concerning Lord Cardigan. There are also three letters written to you personally, my lord, complaining of Lord Cardigan's language on the drill ground. There is also uh, what I take to be a round robin, apparently containing the names of a majority of officers, complaining of his lordship's customs of berating officers before the entire regiment. We must really do all we can to stop this absurd public clamour. 
It is damaging to us all, and I'll not have it. But it must be handled with tact. See to it, Airy. Gentlemen, I have been ordered by the General Commander-in-Chief to address the officers of this regiment. It is the custom of the service and is irremediable. In the case of Captain Nolan, the General Commander refuses his request for a court-martial that might be prejudicial to the good of the service and cause public disquiet. As for the conduct of Lord Cardigan, Lord Raglan expects that in the future his Lordship will exercise the correct amount of discretion and forbearance. Listen. A minute. Oh, Nolan, it is good to have you with us. Everything seems so changed. You've been in our thoughts every day, has he not? You have indeed. It has been an anxious time. You are good friends. I promised Fanny I would help her school Bob. Not that she needs my instruction. <laughs> Captain Nolan is the horseman. Perhaps he should... No, Clarissa, he's tired. I'll go. You can talk together. It will not be long. No. He is very happy. I believe we all are. Yes. The three of us. Edward does everything because of you. I am very flattered. He loves you dearly. He adores you. He worships you. He thinks of you constantly. He quotes you. And yet he is still Edward. When we last spoke, I expressed too much. It would be an offence between us if I were to deny it. I do not think I say such a thing to you lightly or easily. It is not easy to hear. To Please, listen. pay no attention. Oh, no, but, but do not go. It would hurt Edward terribly. You know that I long for the joy of being with you. Why has this happened between us? There is no logic here. You might say two men who love each other are sure to love the same woman. Oh, but nonsense. We cannot escape what we are tied to. Interior stables, firing drill, men and horses. Sergeant O'Hara. Look at you! That man! With that bear! Pull her out! She can't stand for her! She'll rear straight up and then fall back and crush you before you can slip from the saddle. She killed three men like that. It all takes too long. You should be able to train these horses up to a minimum standard in 14 days. 14? And those useless steel scabbards. Every sword in the regiment is like a butter knife because of it. In India, we had wooden ones and swords you could shave a gooseberry with. Mm. The whole training system's too timid. All made up of ifs and buts, words which ought to be unknown to a cavalry officer. Mm. <coughs> oh. Nolan takes on a frightened horse. Eventually, as the horse is gradually subdued, we realise that Nolan has been whispering to it. A complete calm. Oh, she, she's a devil, that one, sir. Can you tell me what you did, sir? Xenophon's word should be painted upon every stable. Pardon? Horses are taught not by harshness, but by gentleness. Ah. Mm. For classical officers, the inscription should, of course, be in Greek. Oh, I say. Hard on some of us. Prisoner on escort! By the left! time I had floggings on a Sunday was with the 17th. Times wrote an impertinent article. Tried to lobby Wellington to relieve me of my command. You're not successfully, my lord. Certainly not, Captain Lockwood. The Duke could always be relied upon to protect officers against penny newspapers and politicians and any other rabble. Well, 
Let them scribble against this one. The men have been formed round three sides of the square. The prisoner advances a pace or two in front of the escort and at the command of Cardigan strips to the waist. He is then fastened to the machine termed a triangle which usually consisted of three poles tied together at the top. The farriers who are to inflict the punishment take off their caps and jackets. Go on! And One, Sergeant O'Hara sees that the two, farriers do their duty. Two, Sergeant O'Hara gives the time two, to the farriers by audibly counting three, in slow time. When the first farrier has inflicted 25 lashes, Sergeant two, O'Hara calls out in a loud voice. 25! Two, stop! 25! And then orders a second farrier to supply the place of the first and so on. Lockwood records the number of lashes. Sergeant O'Hara stands behind the farrier with a cane to see that he does not lay on lightly or unfairly. The prisoner is released from the triangle, his shirt is thrown over him, and he is marched to the hospital. My Lord Raglan, there are other matters. The question of the Sunday flogging. The outcry now is very great, my Lord. Oh, Ari? Yes. What can I do? Besides, I have other more important concerns. The Tsar is playing a very dangerous game, Eric. Sergeant O'Hara. Uh, my lord. You are a sergeant in Captain Nolan's troop. Sir? While he's been on leave, I have discovered that he is not only inciting the regiment against me, he is attempting to slander me constantly. In view of the seriousness of the matter, I have decided that notes will be taken of the conversation of officers, and Captain Nolan in particular. You will take notes in secret wherever you see fit, in the stables, the orderly room, the regimental office, and you will bring them directly to me. That is an order. Dismiss. I'm not wearing that. It's like the flunkier troop in the gun effect. What are they? New stable jackets. It's a costume, son. It's not a uniform. It doesn't fit anywhere. Hey, mine fits. Oh, look. Get it to fit. I'll get it to fit. Oh, quite the thing. It is quite small. Oh, what do we look like, eh? The song get one of them, eh? <laughs> Come on, my lads. This lordship wants you all to look more beautiful. And beautiful you'll be, or I'll have your murphies. <laughs> <laughs> A triumph, my lord. Lord Ragnar will be delighted. A most splendid performance. <laughs> uh, no more trouble, eh? There are dissident elements in spite of every effort. Ah, Nolan. A very fine turnout indeed, particularly your own troop. Thank you, sir. It is my own troop I wish to speak to you about. I hope... This is not more dissension, Captain. Sir, discretion forbids me to mention the humiliation of an officer being spied on by his men, or indeed the pang of being told by them that they have been instructed unwillingly to do so. <coughs> I must draw your attention to a specific matter, the debt in my troop book. This is due to the issue of new stable jackets, which I believe to be unnecessary and ordered by Lord Cardigan without my consent. The men do not want them, but apart from this, although every troop in the regiment has been issued with the same new jackets, only my troop has been called on to pay for them. These are very extraordinary accusations to make against the commanding officer. Cardigan? Nolan is a liar. He was born dishonoured and a liar, and he will die one. Do you hear me, Nolan? Hmm? Nolan? Nolan! Come back, sir! Come back, liar! 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 My dear Captain Nolan, please. Well, now, what have we here? What indeed, my lord? Well, it seems you have set your heart on selling out your commission. I've asked you here today so that we may discuss your grievances and try to persuade you against it. Lord Raglan. I know that as long as I'm with the Earl of Cardigan, the value of my commission is not secure for a day. No, withdraw this resignation. You know you may have what terms you like. I wish only to be free of Lord Cardigan. Well? And another appointment beyond the range of Lord Cardigan. 
I see no problem in all this. You will be appointed to General Airy's staff immediately. War with Russia is quite certainly no more than a matter of weeks away. There'll soon be no time for speculations, or indeed for passing introspections, eh, Captain Nolan? You'll find yourself in the thick of things. What is happening, my lord? Lord Aberdeen has received a report from Jerusalem. Wars have often been sparked off by trivial differences of opinion, eh? <laughs> the monks started to squabble again. But behind them is the Tsar. The Tsar has the seized Ottoman Turkey. Empire is the sick man of Europe. And Everybody is up in arms, and we are off to Russia. Sebastopol, to be precise. It's long, long since we've been in a battle. Officers and men alike. I swear to Jesus, I haven't forgot the smell. Aye, the smell of war. But for them that's above me, it's so long ago, so in the distance, that it's acquired a perfume. <laughs> you should listen to them banging on about glory. <laughs> glory. And, gentlemen, you not only have the proud uh, privilege of setting forth in the finest army in Europe. No nation anywhere has such a magnificent flower, such an ornament uh, at its head. These contemptible Russians, savages, Russian savages, will have seen nothing like us in their lives. We shall astonish them. We shall astonish the world. Gentlemen, the regiment. It is cold, Russia. Cold. Oh, I'll not freeze, my darling one. I'll see the Black Mountain again. But bitter cold it is. So they say. And it was a famous story. Proclaim both fair and wide So let your children's children Re-echo its wind pride Oh, Cardigan the fearless His name immortal made When he crossed the Russian valley With his famous light brigade I cannot, for the life of me, see what the Tsar can be expected to do if he wrenches the key of the holy places away from the Latin monks. He will outrage every Catholic in Europe. On the other hand, every priest of his own faith in his own land is plaguing him to tear down the silver star or whatever it is. Is the Tsar an ambitious man? It appears so. It seems strange. What? Oh, all those monks squabbling over a key. And what is it? A silver star? If it should come to war with Russia, will they send the light cavalry along with the army? I should hope so. There'll be some angry demonstrations at the horse guards if they don't. Do you think they would select the 17th? Certainly. And the 8th? Quite probably. And the 11th? I hope not. Wouldn't our Captain Nolan be a loss at such a time? He would to me. You see, Clarissa, the most important assets for a cavalry officer are not, as he put it, what was it? The strike in the eye. It's not that. It's wealth and nobility. Not ability. Nolan is an exceptional fellow. In the event of a war, he'll certainly get a staff appointment. Lord Raglan thinks highly of him. The Lord Lucan. Lord Lucan is a strong, active man with the remains of hardy, romantic good looks. Lord Lucan. Raglan. He is a fool, but not such a fool as his brother-in-law, Lord Cardigan. A fool, but a thoughtful, introspective fool, for all his brutality and ruthlessness. You are here sooner than I expected. Mm. Forgive me for summoning you in such haste. Surprised you didn't send for me before. Everyone could see what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well? Then I will come directly to the point. Tomorrow afternoon, it will be announced in Parliament 
that the negotiations with Russia have been broken off. None too soon? Yeah, possibly, or maybe right. The Duke of Newcastle and Lord Aberdeen's cabinet are framing a declaration of war well, at this moment. Damn Parliament and Aberdeen and his damn silly bits of paper. What are you doing about the army? The grand military and political objects of the war... The Tsar's head. These objectives cannot be attained as long as Sevastopol, here you see, and the Russian fleets are still in existence. If this part of the Russian Empire were annihilated, the whole fabric, which has cost the Tsars of Russia centuries to raise up, must fall to the ground. Russia can no longer menace Europe. Mm, gentlemen, but who's to command the expedition? The Prime Minister has left the choice to my discretion. Then who is it to be? After consideration, I have decided to undertake command of the expedition to the Crimea myself. Mm. Uh, this leaves a number of vital commands to be appointed. As for active service, Ragnon, I campaign with the Russians against the Turks. As you may know. Of course, I remember. That was... Oh, I don't remember. 26 years ago. What, 1828, 29? Something like that. And since that time? Nothing. But then how many senior officers in the British Army have seen active service in the field in their entire lives? <laughs> I ask you. Indeed. The Duke of Wellington always held a very high opinion of your qualities, Lord Lucan. Quite. As to these staff appointments... The and the cavalry? What of that, Ragnar? My hope, indeed my earnest hope, is that you will consent to assume the command of the cavalry brigade. Very well. As for those under your command, I have offered the command of the heavy brigade to General Sir James Scarlett. Mm, a bit soft, but he'll do. And the light brigade to your brother-in-law, the Earl of Cardigan. Cardigan? Cardigan? Do you mean, sir, that that poopling dummy is to have the light brigade? Of course, like Sir James Scarlet, he will be acting under your command. Have you informed him of that? I think Lord Cardigan's position will be made amply clear to him. Nothing has ever been made clear to that puffed-up, silly old partridge. My wife was born a fool, but the most foolish thing she ever did was to have an even bigger fool for a brother. I am relying on you both to make the appointments work as amicably as possible, in the interests of the expedition mm -hmm. and of the nation. Yeah. I shall be at the townhouse in the meantime. Now, I put it to you, Ragland, that you make Lord Cardigan's position clear to him, so that even he may understand it. Mm -hmm. Lucan? Lucan commanding the cavalry? I came to be offered a command not to serve Lord Lucan. I he doesn't know one end of a... Lord Cardigan, that after a while you may be persuaded that it is an arrangement that can be made to work with a little intelligent flexibility on all sides. Mm. You will see it as being in the nation's interest. After all, you will have the light brigade. God help us all. I'll try to mail from Sebastopol. Ah, we'll be all right. We're the Light Brigade. What bird is that? A plover. Isn't it? Mm. A plover it is. <laughs> <laughs> there, I knew. I feel I should propose a toast or something of the kind. I'm not sure what. Not the Crimea. No, not. Well, then, what about Nolan? <laughs> no. No. The three of us. The three of us. The three of us. <laughs> Interior night. Nolan reads a manual. Clarissa sews. Morris smokes a cigar in the doorway leading into the garden. Presently he moves out and disappears. Clarissa and Nolan alone. Edward? He's gone for a walk, I expect. Is he unwell? He's missing you already. It's a pity you're not leaving for London the same day. Perhaps he should go earlier so that... No. At least it is certain you will see him again. Try to prevail on him. So many wives are going. I'm sure he can be made to agree. I do want to come. This is a bad turning, I know it. 
Forgive my weakness. I am with child. I didn't know. I think... I think it may have been unkind to conceal it from me. I couldn't bring myself. Edward has longed to tell you. I am so unhappy. You must not. I must. I am. You will be happy, surely, for your own sake and Edward's. I am. I shall be. I beg you not to entertain any other thoughts. They are there. They are there. Like unwelcome guests. No, not unwelcome. Welcome. I long for it to be... To be yours. I am very blessed by that. Please, take my hand. I... Uh... My dear, I must join Edward. It is a cold night. There is some madness in you that has infected us all. We shall never, any of us, be the same. Well, not Edward or I, certainly. When... When you are there... Or with him, remember my heart is, is, oh, is. Captain, will you tell me, where is Lord Cardigan? My lord, I have an instruction from his lordship to inform you that he has left for Paris yesterday. What? And has sent his yacht the Dryad ahead to join him. Paris? Why is he not here with the brigade? Who is to command the light brigade? Lord Cardigan asked me to inform you that he intends to report to Scutari and assume command of the brigade forthwith. Yes, Captain. The cavalry will not leave these shores before dawn tomorrow, and I'll not be there for a week yet. Let him dare go on ahead. What an adventure it all is! Now's the time to leave her, Johnny. One more day, did you swear you'd not deceive her, Johnny? One more day, oh, we're outward bound tomorrow, Johnny. One more day, will you leave her without sorrow, Johnny? One more day. Only one more day, me Johnny. One more day. Oh, come and rock and roll me over. One more day. That too. Canny, Sergeant. Canny? Canny? C6, Sergeant. Oh, oh, oh. Lord, this is worse than... This is no bit of a squall only. That man. Braithwaite, Sergeant. Braithwaite. Hi, right, sir. Squall, eh? Sheila, uh, were you? Fisherman. Whitby. There's another wave. I'm going to oh. Braithwaite, sir. I don't feel to adjust myself. Well, get hold of something then, are you? Oh. Now! I'm oh. done in peace! <laughs> ah, feet wide apart, and you, Sergeant? Oh, all right. Oh, oh. oh we're over a sea, bloody Russia. Oh, face the wave. See it? See it rise. Feet firm. Feet firm, mine. And down we go with it. Oh. Again. Hey, oh. there. Oh. Squall be every good. Oh. Oh, well, it's God. <laughs> Fantastic! You see? Aye. Here's another! Oh. Hey. Oh. Here's your sea legs, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, this height there nearly. Oh, no, no, that's only old. Oh, no. Honest, I was nearly over. <laughs> oh, Jesus, nearly slept. <laughs> Don't fall in me, lads. I can't swim. Ah, fishermen reckon we all got a death. Hmm. 
Clarissa. Mm. She longs to be aboard with us. It's a sad business we cannot still be all together. But in a very happy cause. Yes. We both wept. She sends her deepest affection and regards to you, Nolan. Oh, and this letter. Um, sealed order, mind, till we uh, set sail. Well, <laughs> this is an irksome business. However, it is a test of patience, I dare say. It is the beginning of a very long test, my dear lady. Morris is lying asleep. There is a copy of the Times over his face. Nolan looks over at him, still fingering Clarissa's letter. He turns it over in his hand, looks ashore, then at the letter again. He opens the letter. My dearest, it is so completely wrong to aspire to such strange thoughts as I have. I long for you to survive and have life and return to me. And yet I cannot offer the same feelings for my own husband. God help us. We are trapped in a foreboding we cannot escape. Somehow I believe this stems from your strange and impossible ways. How you race from one impossible situation to another with a virtual glee. What have you done to us all? With an effort, as if it were an act of self-amputation, he looks back at Morris, kisses the letter, and then drops it gently into the sea. It bobs amongst the rubbish against the side of the ship before the current starts to drag it away. Is there any good reason why I should not take the Light Brigade on to Varna? Only that Lord Lucan should first be informed as commander of the Cavalry Brigade. He is expected yeah. to arrive within a day or two. And I am sure that Lord Lucan will see the advantage of pressing on to Varna quickly. Do you agree it should be done? I see nothing against it. Very well, then. So be it. Have your way, then. It is too warm for argument. Proceed on to Varna with the Light Brigade at once. Do you think it's wise to let him go ahead on his own without Lucan's knowledge? I think it's certainly prudent to keep them apart as often as convenient. I don't relish the sight of Lucan's face when you tell him. Neither do I, General Airy. Neither do I. <laughs> Gorn? Gorn where, in God's name? Varna, my lord. Varna, I can't wait. Gorn to Varna? Rotting. How dare you go to Varna? I, I get no orders made to go to Varna. He shall move or stay put as I say. As I say, not as he will. Does, does Raglan know of this? Lord Raglan gave the instruction. Gave? To that, 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 that partridge? Tell the captain we shall move on to Varna at once. Now. I'll have him. Lord Raglan says you are to report to him immediately oh, uh, on your arrival. Really? Below decks, Nolan collapses painfully down a gangway, trying to find the place where the horses are quartered. He falls to his knees and struggles up. The wild storm continues as hanging lamps lurch crazily to reveal to Nolan a scene of complete confusion. As the ship rolls from one side to another, row upon row of horses are pitched forward and back to the accompaniment of screaming and stamping on the woodwork of their boxes and the yells of the men who are trying to control them. The rows of frantic horses struggle to their feet or flounder and kick at the desperate men who are trying to help. Picking his way through the confusion, Nolan finds his own horse. The animal rears and struggles, even though she appears to recognise it is he. Nolan grapples with her. As the storm abates, the scene of exhausted men and injured horses. Nolan is in his horse's stall. He lies back beside it, exhausted, and barely able to comfort it. Out on the deck, a horse is pitched overboard. 
It hurtles downwards into the sea, its quarters stretched in the air. Nolan looks out to sea. The sounds of horses gone mad and being shot behind him. Yet another splash, then dozens of dead horses bobbing in the sea. September the 14th, the west coast of the Crimean Peninsula. The British expeditionary force of 25,000 men under Lord Raglan are landed. Captain, will you explain to me why your men have cloaks strapped to their saddles? The men have no blankets, my lord, and at night the wind is very strong and cold, and they may be sleeping in the open. Take off their cloaks, Captain Morris. Have their cloaks taken off their saddles. I will have no effeminate ideas among the soldiers of the Light Brigade. Who will sing the anthems and who will tell the story? Well, the line falls, will it scatter and run? Shall we at last? Be united in glory. Only remember for what we have done. Only remember. Only remember. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I don't think the country here is all that like it, but its hills and valleys, and the colours maybe, remind me still of the Black Mountain, of Donegal and Antrim and Fermanagh, and of the north of Ireland in general. Everything is grand. More than grand. Good food. Home soon. This will be over and me safe in your arms before Michaelmas. Only remember. Only remember. Only remember. There is a goldfinch. Blaze, flights, red on the cheek. Just like our own, but bigger. It's in from Siberia. I limed it caught. And it's singing the same song as our own. Why does it make me feel even more far away? Hear it. If you could hear it. Imagine you can hear it. And I'm there, in Whitby, by the water in Yorkshire County with my best love. No erring, no nothing proper to eat. But the goldfinch sings for Siberia. A kiss for Rosie. Your own skipper. Will there be any stars, any stars in my crown when at evening the sun if you could see the uniform, my darling one, Chrissy, my dear one, epaulets and shine and buttons and red, we parade daily and every local stops to stare. Jings we look broad, grand and magnificent. We're redcoats, of course, so maybe your auntie would remember them in your own farm, but this is bigger work, God's work. And I hope she'll see me all buttoned and busket and no mind the memory. Cardigan comes down the ranks. Well done. Capital. Fine job, Jock. He called me Jock. 
This has been written for me by the corporal, who writes for us all. I hope you think it sounds like me. I say I love you in this note because, well, he doesn't have the Gaelic. Oh, Judy, should I die in glory In the times you'll read my story But I'm so bothered by your charms I'd rather die within your arms Lord Farewell. There's a man singing, but here in the light before dawn, his song is of me missing you and my home. On the march in the morning, on the map it says Alma. That means soul. And so it is with my soul and my heart. I miss you. Only remember. Only remember. Only remember for what we have done. Shall we at last be united in glory? Only remember for what we have done. So parched. I've seen this before. I've seen this before. Oh, God. Oh. Oh, canteen. Canteen. Yeah, take a sip. No, no water, breath with. No water. No, try. Try, son. He's turning black, the poor, poor bastard. Oh, oh he's... Oh, he, God. He's turning black. Poor, oh. poor bastard. Then, look at this. The sound of dying. Bodies blackened fall into pools of water. Horses approach. Lucan and Charteris. It's cholera, my lord. Eleven men have died, and, and there are more. Damn cholera, or whatever you call it. We're not here to drop dead of the vapors like girls. Get them up. Inside the tent, in the candlelight, the face of Nolan's groom just caught in the grip of cholera. His eyes appeal for help and he manages to put out a hand to Nolan who withdraws with instinctive fear. Even in his agony, the man looks shocked by this response from a distinguished officer. He tries to speak. Nolan reaches for some water to give him. The man tries to touch him again and again Nolan withdraws. The man manages to mouth the word water. Nolan stares at him in horror turns and goes. Nolan outside the tent. He breathes the air in deeply. He is about to take some water from the pitcher, then realises it may be contaminated. He throws it away, then looks guilty at the sound it makes. He looks to see if he has been observed, but there is no sign of anyone, just the groans of the dying man. September last, the 18th day, we landed safe at Big Crime, eh? In spite of all the splashing spray, to cheer our hearts for Alma. That night we lay on cold, cold ground, no tent, no shelter to be found. And with the rain was almost drowned upon the heights of Alma. Next morning a scorching sun did rise Beneath the eastern cloudy skies Our noble chief, Lord Raglan, cries Prepare to march for Alma Oh, when the heights we hove in view The stoutest heart it could subdue To see the Russian warlike crew Upon the heights of Alma Our Scottish lads in kilt and hose we're not the last you may suppose So daring face their fearful foes And gain the heights of Alma Dear God! 
Why is it all happening? A thousand of our horsemen looking on at a retreating enemy, a wretched horde of Cossacks and cowards who never struck a blow, ready to turn tail at the first trumpet, and all ten minutes gallop away. We shall have our turn, Nolan. It's not Raglan's fault. Damn our turn! What is happening to the world? We are in the grip of mad people! Oh, as, as for the noble yachtsman and Lord Lucan, it is impossible that God ever created two greater muffs. Lucan is a cautious ass, and Cardigan's a dangerous ass. And yet they command. And why? <laughs> they are earls. They want everything but be assured they are earls. <sighs> Exterior. The Alma battlefield, evening. Nolan wanders alone, shattered by the dreadful spectacle of the field and the sounds of the wounded. A British soldier gives water to a Russian officer and is shot in the back for his pains by a wounded Cossack. Nolan watches the scene in slow horror. Then he goes over to the Russian, takes out his pistol and shoots the wounded Cossack. Sickened, he wanders away in an exhausted daze toward his tent. Morris is there, smoking a cigar. They look out together across the plain. You're shivering. It's cold. Oh, I'm cold. What are you thinking of? I was thinking... I was thinking about tomorrow. Hmm. We should attack. And you? What? Thinking about... Oh! Oh! I was thinking of Clarissa. In the cavalry camp of the Light Brigade above Balaclava, row upon row of bell tents. Outside the tents, remote, unworldly-looking officers recline in all kinds of attitudes, sometimes looking as if they were outstretched upon the lawns of Oxford colleges. Then everywhere is the baggage of men and horses, of live cattle kept for slaughter, of sweating troopers and stamping horses. All the chaos of a vast army inadequately fitted out for a disastrous, epic picnic. They sit up there on the hillock and watch it. <laughs> the bottle, I mean. Oh, telescopes they have. And opera glasses. <laughs> like it was the theatre and we were the actors. It's a drama, all right. For them that's on that hillock. Not many limbs are lost at Drury Lane. <laughs> ah, what the heck. It's a good bullet, and the vittles are good. <laughs> and I always think it's myself they're looking at. The British camp is awake and about its business. French officers in red peg-top trousers and jaunty kepis swagger about with the condescending air of professionals watching the goings-on of amateurs. In contrast to the French... Many of the British officers are wearing Czech sporting coats above their tight regimental trousers with fancy shirts and flowered neckerchiefs. Captain Dubly himself is wearing a braided French kepi above his hussar jacket. Look! Look what I found! It matches my number ones in this French kepi. It's a photograph, surely, is it not? Where is that Times, Johnny? Where is he? Treacherous cove! Other officers are wearing an extraordinary assortment of gear, gold-braided forage caps, felt wide-awakes of all colours over otherwise impeccable regimental rig. Here and there, even a Turkish fez from the bazaars, or, most surprising of all to the French, various kinds of sun helmets with flowing white or coloured veils. Trotteries! Who's that naked fella? Over there! Lord de Ross, General. Uh, do you not think he'll get sunstroke like that? Lord de Ross. I have made my wishes to Lord Cardigan clear on this matter. He chooses to ignore them. I will have my officers properly dressed. I take an order. Lord Lucan observes that some officers, and in particular those under Lord Cardigan's command, are not wearing their gold sword knots as prescribed by regulations. Gold sword knots, yes, as prescribed by regulations. Lord Lucan will see to it personally that failure to conform with this order will bear heavy penalties. <laughs> heavy <laughs> penalties. No, yes, yes. Now have these orders dispatched at once. British officers abroad on active service will not be allowed to make themselves ridiculous. 
They will dress as they do in their own country. Well, no limits a rum business, this life, this being a soldier. Yes, my friend. I'm frustrated. Yeah, you must be patient. No, I'm not patient. My heart often burns at the simple waste of my life. In a way, it is consumed by obsolete forms and unyielding ways and poverty of feelings. These fine gentlemen, they are not only above the dreams of common men, they are above the law itself, with their wealth and their privilege and their fine horses and proud heads. How else could such a mighty blockhead as Cardigan pass over so many better, finer men and find himself commanding one of the finest regiments of cavalry in the British Army? Mm. But if I am often impatient, I am also prudent. A soldier needs to be certain of his objectives. If he lacks that, that certainty, he must find himself or try to win strategy in order, or he will lose his head. He will lose his way altogether and be lost. That is why horses mean so much to me. They can be trained and turned into a thing of precision and perfection. They can even be loved to a degree. Mm. <laughs> and at moments like this, my friend, is it not fun? Hmm? The most glorious life a man could lead. Huh? <laughs> and it was a famous story. It is dawn. The cloudy gloom of men and horses waves and heaves here and there. A sinewy blur in the dark, sickly start of morning. The ear strains to hear a strange, muffled, musical, haunting sound. The brigade of cavalry rising quietly and preparing for the day. Make out the breath of men and horses. Then their forms. The sound increases. Low orders are barked and muttered. Swords clatter. Breastplates and lances and saddles creak and rattle. Horses snort and stamp the ground and are rubbed down and saddled up. Everyone is turning out. The ground is littered with the remains of fires, dismantled canvas, holes and mounds of earth and equipment. Men move quietly, speaking little, some muttering to their mounts or cursing. Some surreptitiously eat up the remains of breakfast from a dish or light a pipe or spit. One shivers, another swears at his sword buckle. Sergeant O'Hara adds a line to something he has written. You can say to the boy... There was a parade, and such a grand parade, that his papa was, oh, never so proud. The brass and the bands and the buttons, and me with the colours itself. Oh, let him be a soldier too, and maybe he'll live to be in the green and carry the colour of Ireland. Lord Raglan. Ah, Nolan. My lord, the enemy has advanced, taken the redoubts, and now his infantry is advancing from the Terragoran. Lord Lucan has brought up the heavy brigade. The cavalry is already exposed to musketry from the redoubts two, three, and four. They are bearing down on Balaclava. There's only one thing to do, my lord. Bring up the first and fourth. Precisely. Terry, inform Lord Lucan. He'll manage all right. I'm not so sure about Kafka. What do you think, Nolan? Perhaps I might deliver the order in person. Good. Tell Cathcart he's to move his division immediately. And tell him immediately. Ah! Nolan, sir, just in time for breakfast. Lord Raglan requests you, Sir George, to move your division immediately to the assistance of the Turks. Move? Move? Quite impossible for the 4th Division to move. My orders are very positive, Sir George. I can't help that, sir. And the Russians are advancing upon Balaclava. It is impossible for my division to move, sir. The greater portion of the men have only just come from the trenches. The best thing you can do is to sit down and take some breakfast with me. Here. The new officer was having the vapours. So the sergeant said, and up he spoke... That we should all write home as we were never coming back. So here is this letter that you will receive at 
my demise. I fought for my country and died. I was not cowardly. It's bravely I fought until the end for our dear Queen and England. The sergeant said this before, so I hope this letter never has to reach Whitby. A big kiss to Rosie and you, my darling one. If it's God's will that the battle takes your loving husband. When the piper plays, whoever they are, the enemy, be Turk, be Russian, be French, fairly buckle. It's as if it's a sound from the valley of the shadow. Up close in the whites of their eyes, you see the defeat in them when the piper plays. <laughs> have the day. Take the message to Lord Lucan and see that it is also conveyed to all officers and men. Well done. Eh, Nolan? We beat the devils. We licked them all the way up the hill. With respect, sir, we have yet to follow up our advantage. By this time, the light brigade should have been over that hill. Where are they now? Ah, Morris. My lord. Oh, damn those heavies, eh, Morris? They've had the laugh of us this day. My lord, I do urge you to attack the enemy and follow up the heavies' advantage at once before it's too late. No, sir. But do you not see, my lord? No, sir. May I not take the 17? No, sir, you may not. You will act as your superiors tell you. Causeway Heights. Teams of Russian artillery horses thunder along the Causeway Ridge with lasso tackle attached to them to drag away the English guns. Airy looks through his telescope. They've captured our guns. They're taking them away. Wellington never lost a gun, and nor shall I. Take this instruction to Lord Lucan. The cavalry is to advance at once. They will be supported by the infantry, which has been ordered to advance on two fronts. Let us hope. Supported by the infantry? Where are they? We shall wait. The light brigade wait. The heavy brigade wait. The Russians continue withdrawing the guns up the valley. Do you see that Russian army, my lord? For 50 minutes, Lord Lucan has stood by and watched them, and all the time they're ready to be completely rolled up by an attack of cavalry. The mere sight of our brigade moving would be enough. General Eric, my lord, this is the fourth order I have dispatched to advance his cavalry at once. Kindly take this down in your clearest handwriting so that it may not be misunderstood or ignored a fourth time. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front. Follow the enemy. Captain Nolan, try to prevent will you the read enemy. the order I've just dictated to General Airy in his own handwriting? Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. The troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. Immediate, signed, airy. Very good, Captain. See that it is delivered, delivered and executed. Nolan puts the order into his sabretache. Everyone watches him with some awe as he dashes off recklessly and fervently and as only such a superb horseman might dare. He drives his horse down the treacherous Sapoon Ridge with miraculous skill, on down into the North Valley to Lucan's position in advance of the Light Brigade. Lucan is with Cardigan. Sir... Who are you? Oh, I was sure you'd met our Indian captain. This is Captain Nolan, my lord. Nolan? Yes. Will you execute Lord Raglan's order, my lord? I am waiting. Captain uh, Nolan, if you look before you, you will see neither enemy nor guns. The usefulness of such an order as this eludes me. The position, my lord, I assure you, is clearer from above the valley where Lord Raglan stands. Is it? Lord Raglan's orders are that the cavalry should attack immediately. Attack? Attack, sir? Attack what? What guns, sir? Nolan? Mr. Nolan? Where? Where? Now tell me. Hmm? Huh? 
Where and what to do? There. There, my lord, is your enemy. There are your guns. Cardigan, I suggest you advance steadily and, and keep your men well in control. If the brigade is handled with care, there should be no useless or unnecessary loss. My lord, allow me to point out to you that the Russians have a battery in the valley to our front and batteries and riflemen on each flank. You're quite right, sir. What choice do we have? Very well. Brave Nolan brought the order. The gun, can it be true? Said Cardigan the fearless. And my brigade so few To take those awful cannon From yonder teeming mass Tis madness there Where shall we judge What guns spring from the past Here goes the best of the brood and elves The light brigade will advance Right squadron! Right squadron! Keep back! Do look to your dressing! Cardigan trots ahead of the light brigade, erect but stiff in the saddle. He wears the uniform of his old regiment, the 11th Hussars, richly decorated in front with gold lace. His figure is rigid and collected, as if he were merely schooling a skilful horse. Across his path to the right, a wild figure appears. It is Captain Nolan, turning round in his saddle, shouting and waving his sword as if he wanted to address the entire brigade. Cardigan's face sets into fury. Now Nolan, in his desperate mime, ahead of the brigade, pointing towards the causeway heights on the right, his left shoulder is straining in mime towards the south, his legs kicking his horse in the same direction. Cardigan's face twitches with rage at the spectacle of a junior officer daring to move in front of the advancing brigade in this way. It seems a cruel outrageous taunt to him. His muscles stiffen and he continues to trot on, fixing his gaze straight ahead down the valley. Nolan and his mount pivot round desperately in an effort to make a final sign, like an agonised dancer's last leap before he crumbles. A Russian shell bursts on the right front of Cardigan and throws out a fragment which hits Nolan full on the chest and tears into his heart. The sword drops from his hand, but the arm with which he was waving the moment before remains lifted high in the air, and his horseman's instinct still keeps him firm in his saddle. Immediately missing the perfect hand of his master, the horse wheels about and begins to gallop back upon the front of the advancing brigade. Nolan is still erect in the saddle, his sword arm still high in the air. From this strange object there bursts forth a cry so weird and appalling that every man on the field, with the exception of Cardigan, is chilled by it. The dead man, still firm seated with his uplifted stiff arm, shrieks as he passes through the ranks of the brigade till he passes the 13th Light Dragoons. Then at last he drops out of the saddle. The continuing advance of the brigade. The artillery and rifle fire has not reached the terrifying power it will do very soon. Here and there are horses killed or disabled or an officer or trooper is lost. The ranks close up with the grace and ease which at first seemed so perfect there can surely be no cause for desperate alarm. As soon as a man or charger has been ridden clear, the line closes up and rides on meticulously, scarcely a nose or a moustache out of line. The pace of this process increases, but the skill with which it is carried out keeps up with it until the whole thing has the appearance of some grim, extraordinary mechanism. The skill and order and discipline become more breathtaking as the toll becomes more terrible. Now remember what I have told you. Remember it and keep together. Morris digs in his spurs and leads on to the unwavering Russian ranks. They scarcely move. He drives his horse full at a tall Russian who seems to be a squadron leader. At the instant of contact, his sword transfixes the trunk of the Russian, passing through it with such force that its hilt presses against the man's body. Morris cannot free himself from the wrist knot which joins him to it. As he struggles helplessly, he receives a sabre cut on the left and another deep, clean cut which passes down through the acorn of his forage cap, 
penetrating the skull. He falls to the ground, and as he does so, the impetus releases his own sword from the dead Russian beside him. He lies in a daze, half conscious. What on earth can those skirmishers be doing? Good God! It's the Light Brigade! The remains of the brigade pass up the valley, some walking feebly, some limping, and some crawling. The trappings of the 4th Light Dragoons and the 11th Hussars flap in the breeze against the still living remains of the horses, some struggling violently to get up or floundering back cruelly upon their disabled riders. Morris, still unconscious, is being robbed by some Cossacks who obviously believe that he is dead. As they leave and turn their attentions to other men, he regains consciousness. He finds himself almost run down by a loose charger, but he is just able to catch hold of the horse's rein and mount him. Collapsing into the saddle with great agony, he turns the horse's head up the valley and rides away as fast as he can. Lucan is looking down the valley. Good God! He sees the figure of Cardigan riding at a sharp, unhurried trot. They've sacrificed the Light Brigade. Well, sir? Well, sir? Well, sir, what? I am waiting to hear. And so am I, sir. I have been the witness of such gross criminal folly. To what folly do you refer, sir? That damn Nolan, that's what folly, sir. Riding before a general in brigade like a madman, damn him. And then to shriek like a woman, like some half-wit of a girl. Cardigan, you've just ridden over Captain Nolan's body. Four troopers of the 11th Hussars and Sergeant O'Hara pick up the body of Captain Nolan and bear it, stumbling across the field. They come to a place and set to, digging with their spades. Morris kneels beside the body. He takes off his sword and watch and places them beside Nolan. Men, it was a mad brain trick, but it's no fault of mine. We're ready, my lord. Go again, sir. No, no, Sergeant. You've done enough today. Lord Raglan arrives with General Airy. Raglan waves the stump of his arm angrily. What did you mean, sir? Mean, my lord? Regarding what? What did you mean, sir, by attacking a battery in front, contrary to all the usages of warfare and the customs of the service? My lord, I hope you will not blame me if I receive the order to attack from my superior officer in front of the troops. Lucan! Lord Lucan! Lord, Lucan, you have lost the Light Brigade. Lost the Light Brigade? Indeed, I have not, sir. You have lost the Light Brigade. The finest, the finest brigade that ever left the shores of England. How could you? And there were put six children Against those score thousand foe And in with furious cannon and crushed by savage blows, yet fought they there like heroes for the noble England's fame. Oh, glorious chant, heroic deed, what honor crowns thy name? Well, these sort of things will happen in war. After all, it was nothing to Chilean Waller. For wounded on those soldiers Fell fighting where they stood And so that Russian valley It was enriched with English blood For wounded on those warriors Bequeathed their lives away To an England they had fought for on that wild October day And it was the famous story 
proclaimed both far and wide, so that your children's children may echo it with pride. Oh, Cardigan the fearless, his name immortal made, when he crossed the Russian valley with his famous light brigade. October the 17th, 1854, 247 men lost, many more wounded, and the loss of 497 horses, not counting those thrown into the sea, and all in 20 minutes. The charge was never sounded. The Charge of the Light Brigade by John Osborne. The cast was as follows. Lord Cardigan, Charles Dance. Captain Morris, Jasper Britton. Nolan, Joseph Fiennes. Captain Lockwood, Trevor Ray. Mrs. Dubley, Lynn Miller. Captain Dubley, Guy Lancaster. Lady Errol, Angela Douglas. Clarissa, Charlotte Emerson. General Airy, Geoffrey Palmer. Lord Raglan, Alec McCowan. Sergeant O'Hara, James Ellis. Braithwaite, John Tams. James, William McBain. Lord Lucan, Donald Sindon. Charteris, Robert Oates. Sir George Cathcart, Sebastian Graham Jones. Ballad singer, Michael Waterson. John Osborne, Michael Feast. Studio production, Mark Smith. Post-production supervised and edited by Sebastian Graham Jones, John Tams and Ray Williams. A Promenade Production.